Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Tell the Shadowing. <clears throat> we are recording this session and live streaming it to YouTube. We will be having a Q&A session at the end, and you can ask questions in the YouTube live and Zoom chat, and they will be addressed. I just want to confirm, can everyone see the slide? I just see um, Amna has started screen sharing. OK, now we can see it. Thank you. All right, I'm honored to introduce our mentor for today, Dr. Sadia Hussain. Dr. Hussain is a board certified in internal medicine and geriatric medicine physician. She specializes in geriatrics as an attending physician at a skilled nursing facility. She is also on the faculty of internal medicine residency at Kaiser Permanente. I would now like to request our mentor for today, Dr. Hussain, to begin today's session. Thank you. Hello, everyone. It's my honor and pleasure to be here today with all of you. I will put the slideshow on. Are you seeing the screen? Yes, we can see the screen. Okay, all right. So I'll tell you a little bit about myself and then we'll go dive into the topic. And uh, I think really quickly, I think you can um, escape screen share mode really quickly and then, then we'll, because we see the notes. So everything we can um, escape from it and then you click present and then we'll be able to see the other part of it. Okay, uh, screen sharing. It's okay. Okay, it's fine. Okay. It's, it's fine? Yes. Okay, you can see the slide, right? Yes, we can see the slide, but we also okay. see the notes. I think it's okay. One second. I think at the top, you can click end slideshow and then that'll be okay. able to uh, start off as just the slides and then you'll click um, presenter view. Okay. Right, and then at the bottom, we'll click there. Okay. I think then, I'll go with this mode. Okay, that's okay. Right. And you can also click the three buttons at the bottom and then we won't be able to see the notes. Okay, I think I'll just uh, okay. skip the notes part. Okay. And we'll get going. Awesome. Thank you. Sure. All right. So um, I'm Sadia Hussain, and um, I'll just tell you briefly about myself. Um, I did my medical school from Ayub Medical College from uh, in this beautiful valley of Abbottabad in Pakistan. And after that, I came here and I did my residency in Prince George's Hospital Center, Chevrolet, Maryland, in internal medicine. After that, I... Um, I was, I didn't have the intentions to do fellowship, but I had a great mentor, Dr. Linda Green, who, uh, who uh, encouraged me to go to geriatric medicine. And I think that was a great decision in my life. I joined um, geriatric program at University of Maryland, Baltimore, and I completed my fellowship there. And after that, my first job, uh, was medical directorship uh, at uh, subacute nursing facility and long-term care. So when I started my first job, I was given a tour and a warm welcome. And I was told that I am, I'll be doing the directorship for this 140 bed facility. So that was a little intimidating, uh, but uh, that was 11 years of uh, my medical directorship at that facility and learned a lot from there learned a lot from mistakes. And I learned from, from the administration part to the physicians, to the peer review, even the nurses I learned a lot from. And um, uh, we, were, uh, we were expected to do quality assurance and review the policies and procedures, peer reviews, chart reviews for any changes in condition, transfers, any deaths. And you know, when you do all these reviews, you learn a lot in terms of what could have been done, what was not done, and what was extra that could have been avoided. So that was a great learning curve for me. Uh, 
we were supposed to be active in state surveys and obviously the clinical piece. And doing peer review for other physicians also uh, was, you know, a, a good uh, learning process to, uh, to determine, you know, how we can do things better as a team. And after that, I changed my hats. And then now currently I'm the attending physician for SNF, Subacute Nursing Facility, and uh, faculty with geriatric medicine in internal medicine program at uh, MAP and MG with Kaiser Permanente. So now we can get into the topic. Uh, the topic is dementia. And the, the whole point is that um, with this process of dementia, what can a physician do to make a difference? And what I'll do is I'll highlight important points from the slides. So I want you to be with me as we go through this, you know, the whole um, epidemiology, the risks and diagnosis and management, and then focusing on as physicians, where can we make a good difference? Uh, moving on. So the objectives of this talk today is that, you know, we want to know the risks, causes of dementia, and then how to evaluate these patients and um, to have uh, the family and patient uh, be there to, en to encourage them to, uh, to be involved in the history uh, part and get as much information, the right information and have a plan for them. Um, and each patient is unique and we have to uh, make a plan for their behavioral and pharmacological treatment and the strategies basically to minimize any personal, social and financial impacts of dementia. And then at what point uh, we refer patients and caregivers to available community resources. So what is dementia? Uh, it's a very common term, sometimes misused, but uh, let's get clear on what is dementia. It's actually a, an acquired syndrome and it is a decline in memory as well as other cognitive functions. And other cognitive functions would include um, your insight, judgment, how you perceive a problem, uh, problem solving, uh, decision making, all those things, okay? And it's not like, you know, I lost my key, I, I misplaced my remote. Uh, sometimes older folks then, you know, they, they, they worry about dementia, it's not, that common. That's it's actually normal for uh, for for getting things. That's an, um, that's normal. So we have to differentiate where the abnormality starts. Uh, in dementia, it affects the daily life in an alert patient, and it is progressive. It is disabling, and we will see the stages how it it gets progressive and how it disables to what point. And it is not an inherited aspect of aging. So we have to stay away from ageism that you know attribute everything to because this person is aging, so he has this. No, um, it, um, forgetting things in normal aging versus uh, symptoms of dementia, there is a difference. And there could be some overlap, we'll go over it. And it is, as I said, it is different from normal cognitive lapses. So as you can see in the epidemiology, what we want to remember from this slide is that um, Alzheimer's is present in six to eight percent of people with more than 65 years of age and geriatric population, by the way, starts at 65. Um, so six to eight percent of people have Alzheimer's dementia and it keeps doubling every five years. So you can imagine that at the age of 85, it, nearly 45% uh, of people you know, of age more than 85 may have uh, uh, Alzheimer's dementia. Now, another thing is that in clinical setting, what we see uh, more often is mixed dementia. And mixed dementia is Alzheimer's and vascular dementia. Vascular dementia occurs in people with hypertension, diabetes, high cholesterol, all the all uh, the chronic diseases that affect the vasculature of the body as they can cause heart attack, as they can cause atherosclerosis, 
they can cause dementia in the brain also for the same vascular changes that are happening in the rest of the body. Actually, um, vascular dementia is also called as, um, it's so common in uh, diabetics that it's called as uh, type three diabetes. Um, so that is, you know, I want you to be familiar with the terms vascular, mixed, Alzheimer's, and then there is another term, Lewy body dementia, which is second most common cause of dementia. Actually, in clinical setting, we haven't seen much, but it's whenever we see, it's a very interesting presentation, and we'll talk about that later. Uh, next, huge impact on emotional aspect and economic aspect, billions of dollars are spent not just for the medical um, care of dementia uh, patients, but also the social care and informal care. Uh, Medicare, Medicaid, private, private insurances, you know, it's, it's the, the, and then the cost of the, uh, from the families and their caregivers also. Now, um, I want you to focus on this, uh, this image, then we can go on, um, you know, the protein part of it. So you can see that on the left side, it's normal uh, brain image with, these are the cortices of the brain and um, you don't see much space in the ventricles, right? Uh, now, what happens in dementia is there is extreme shrink shrinkage of the cerebral cortices. You can see how they are shrinking and because of that shrinkage and the, the decrease in the mass of the brain, the ventricles become bigger, severely enlarged um, ventricles. And that's what we see um, in uh, dementia patients. And here, I want you to focus on this extreme shrinkage of the hippo hippocampus part. This is very specific for the Alzheimer's people. So that's where we are with the, you know, how it would look on a scan. And then uh, if you want to remember um, what are the proteins and what happens, we want to remember this term of amyloid, amyloid plaques. In Alzheimer's, there are protein plaques that, are, uh, th that build up in the brain mass um, uh, and disturb the neurotransmission. So these are the, either the amyloid plaques or the neurofibrillate tangles, and they also interfere with the neurotransmission. Now, in Lewy body dementia and frontal uh, temporal dementia, there are different uh, proteins, um, but I want you to focus on the amyloid plaques and the neurofibrillate tangles for uh, Alzheimer's dementia. That's actually, uh, in medical school, that's a given question for, you know, what do you see? Uh, okay. Now, um, coming to risk factors for dementia, we have some protective factors and others are obviously the risk factors. For, uh, first talking about the protective factors, nothing definitive. It's not like if I do this, I will not get dementia, okay? Now the possible risk factors are the anti-inflammatory part, antioxidants, NSAIDs, statins are also big, uh, strong anti-inflammatories. And other than that, uh, a healthy heart is a healthy brain, uh, means healthy brain. So physical activity, intellectual activity, overall health is good. Then the uh, then we anticipate that brain health is good too. So exercise, involvement in um, brain activities, that is a protective factor. Now, when we go to risk factors, uh, age is biggest, and uh, so is family history. Now the EPOE4 allele, which is another term we want to remember is, um, one second. EPOE4 allele is actually the genetic finding that is very suggestive of dementia, but that does not mean people go and ask to be checked for EPOE4 allele because it's, it's, it's the percentage of uh, people having dementia from the EPO, uh, EPOE4 allele is, is very, very low as compared to people having dementia with age and family history and history of uh, head trauma uh, and their formal education, the fewer years of formal education 
and um, cardiovascular risk factors, as we just uh, talked about. So protective factors are anti-inflammatory and anything good for the body and brain activity. Risk factors, we want to make sure that um, we, we remember age and family history. Okay. Again here, um, sometimes dementia can happen before 60 years of age. When it happens before 60 years of age, there are certain proteins involved amyloid precursor protein and presenilin proteins. That, that, is, that is a rare and not common thing um, that we uh, see. Now the actual, the, what we see more often is the late onset, the regular dementia, in which you know, there is ApoE4 allele, uh, which is the greatest risk in those uh, related fashion. All right. Now, knowing a little bit of, you know, what are the risk factors, how common it is, we'll come to if a patient is, um, we see a patient in our clinic and um, the family is concerned that, you know, um, the patient is forgetting eight year old and he is forgetting to the, ex uh, to the extent that it's affecting his daily activities. Uh, so we bring in the patient and uh, important part of this history is unlike, um, you know, a, uh, other clinical cases. In this history, we want to make sure that the caregiver or the, uh, the family member is, is there with the patient. Uh, we want to find out um, when the pro problem started, how is the nature of symptoms, what is the medical history, because we, uh, we will talk about that sometimes there is something else going on and that's presented as forgetfulness, so we don't want to miss that. Uh, this is big medications and medication history. We usually ask the patients to bring their medication bottles with them. You know, not just the list of medications in a bag. Bring the medications. We'll go um, over each one of them, which ones are being taken, which ones are not taken. Sometimes none of them are being taken. And sometimes people are taking more than what's needed. So uh, uh, it's important in that, um, in that setup that we uh, evaluate very closely what medications uh, they are taking because what they are presenting with uh, could be just a side effect of the medications they are taking. Then obviously the you know, alcohol use and what living arrangements are they in. Uh, we do want to, on examination, do a neurological um, uh, exam because we, uh, we don't want to miss that, you know, maybe patient had a TIA after that, uh, he's presenting like this, or maybe it's, it's, a, it's a, a, um, a presentation of a stroke and mental status we want to examine because uh, it could be that patient is delirious uh, from some infection and uh, family, you know, because a geriatric population, we have to remember, they, they could be very subtle signs. And they may not present very typical of what we read um, in textbooks, how UTI presents, how pneumonia presents. So maybe they are presenting with just some forgetfulness and guess what? They have a pneumonia sitting there. Um, then functional status, we want to know, you know, is there any decline? Um, um, and what are their activities of daily living? Okay. Now, um, the, the tests that, uh, that are out there for, um, uh, for this um, uh, dementia evaluation, we have mini mental state exam. We have mini cognitive exam. We have St. Louis University medical um, uh, system uh, evaluation, and then MOCA, Montreal Cognitive Assessment. So out of these, uh, the mini mental state exam was very big when we were doing residency. Right now, MOCA, the Montreal Cognitive Assessment, is on the rise. And we go with this one. Why? Because it catches the uh, mild cognitive impairment. You know, it, 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 is, uh, it is highly sensitive to mild cognitive impairment uh, so that we don't miss that, you know, um, um, th that patient needs to be watched very carefully for how the course will be next six months, one year when they actually de uh, develop dementia. So I found that uh, MOCA very useful in that uh, particular, for that reason. 
Okay, mini COG is, uh, you know, a general screening. Uh, primary care, you know, it's usually done in a primary care setting. It's a general screening of um, the executive functioning and recall. You, you give them uh, three words and they have to repeat after you to see their language, their exact, uh, the, the visual spatial, and then you are asked to repeat at the end if they remember it in the same order. And in between what you ask is to draw a clock um, with um, a certain time, uh, 10 after 11. Uh, now, um, in drawing a clock, you have to look at, uh, you know, the, the actual uh, shape of the clock, then the handles of the clock, and then the digits, and then, you know, the short arm and the long arm, they are placed uh, correctly. So this is like a three-minute thing. And um, any mistake in it um, is basically that, you know, mini cog is positive. That means it needs further evaluation. And then um, if the screening is positive, then um, the primary care can refer to memory care clinic uh, or to geriatric assessment. And you can actually go to mochatest.org uh, for detail on MOCA. It's a very um, user-friendly site and it has, the score of 30 and we'll talk about that what's the cut point for you know mild dementia uh, first of all um, cognitive impairment uh, uh, first is normal then cognitive impairment then mild dementia moderate dementia and severe dementia okay so this is just to give you an idea um we won't go in detail with it this is how a uh, uh, mocha test is done here, you know, with these the trail tracking and copying the cube, we are actually checking their executive functioning of how they relate things and see things in the visual spatial function and the clock drawing with the contour as well as um, uh, the numbers and hands. Now, naming um, the items. Then memory is by giving them five words and then repeating and then asking them again later to the delayed recall. And then, you know, abstraction from something like train and bicycle. Uh, what do you expect them to tell you? That it's a mode of transport. Uh, watch and ruler, uh, what, what's the right answer? That, you know, it's both uh, measure something. Um, then language and then orientation, date, month, year, day, place, city, everything has a, a very set score. Um, you should get a MOCA training before you actually perform it, not just physicians, um, you know, a speech therapist can also perform it. And if the nurses are trained into it, they can perform it, but only a physician would interpret and give a diagnosis. Other, uh, uh, um, other uh, domains will not be, uh, will not, are not supposed to give a diagnosis. Then it, uh, it is evaluated, re-evaluated by the physician to determine where the patient is, because sometimes the functional status may be much better than these numbers, or the numbers may be much better than the functional status. And then the physician has to determine whether there are other confounding factors like hearing problem or, um, um, you know, sleep deprivation or some infection going on. So all those things have to be eliminated before we give a final diagnosis. So anything less than 26 is considered as abnormal and mild cognitive impairment starts at less than 26 out of 30. And then um, the cutoff point is um, around 10 to 17, where we have, uh, after which we have moderate dementia and less than 10 on the score, 10 out of 30 will be severe dementia. And how it will, um, how it will coordinate with the function of the uh, patient, um, I, I'll walk you through some uh, terms like ADLs and IADLs. Uh, ADLs are activities of daily living, and IADLs and IADLs are instrumental activities of daily living. So let's talk about the IADLs first. Instrumental activities of daily living are like, you know, that require much higher uh, brain functioning. That require uh, that includes um, finances, uh, paying checks, um, bills. Um, doing taxes, meal preparation, 
um, medication management and using transport. Like if I have to go from point A to B, can I take a taxi and pay uh, uh, and make the payment? Uh, can I ride a bus? Can I ride a train? So those kinds of things. So remember that because the course will be, you know, first the instrumental activities of daily living are affected and then uh, activities of daily living, the regular activity. What are ADLs? They are like um, able to dress, um, able to uh, feed themselves, toileting, mobility within the house, like getting out of the bed, sitting in the chair, then getting up, going to the bathroom, those kinds of things. And then grooming, are they able to pick clothes for them? Are they dressed properly? Do they know, you know, how to do, um, you know, the, the shirts and pant combination and all, is it looking odd or is it looking normal? So those kinds of things, those will be, um, and bathing, of course, uh, those will be activities of daily living. So once those are affected here, you know, it's all uh, reflected in these scores. So, in the Montreal Cognitive Assessment Evaluation, as we just saw, we are talking about checking orientation, short-term memory, executive functioning, clock drawing for visual spatial um, recognition, the naming and then attention of um, uh, saying series of numbers in the reverse fashion, and you know abstract thinking. What's common between a cycle and a train? Those kinds of questions. And these are set questions. Um, and you know, once you keep repeating them, um, it becomes um, a second nature. Okay, so about labs, I just wanna highlight some of the things. Why we want to do all these labs, you can see them, I, I won't name all of them, they are on the screen. Why we want to do all these is to make sure that um, we, we have to rule out any infection going on that can cause in an elderly to forget things and act differently any hyponatremia, hypernatremia, any dehydration, high or low glucose, do we have any underlying infection like syphilis, hypothyroid, B12 deficiency, you, you know, uh, there is something called B, uh, called B12 madness. So these are very reversible things that we do not, do not want to uh, forget about. So these are standard labs that are should be done for um, a patient with dementia. And other things, depending on, you know, uh, their history, the optional ones, it all depends on history, whether we want to do the rest. Neuropsych testing um, are, is done by neuropsychologists. It's basically to differentiate um, the subtypes of dementia and um, mild cognitive impairment from early dementia. Uh, and especially when uh, we are doing this MOCA test and the primary language of the patient is not English, then it, it comes in very handy. And um, to differentiate dementia uh, with depression because it tests moods also. So it can um, you know, eliminate um, that no, there is no um, attributing factor from depression. It is solely uh, dementia. So in, uh, in those areas, it, it's, it's very useful. It's not done um, very frequently. Usually the history, the imaging, um, and their um, uh, you know, medications all together will give, up, give, give us enough information. But in certain cases, um, this can be done. Um, you have to uh, do a referral for it. OK. Now, uh, we have a patient of dementia. We, we want to make sure that uh, there is a neurology evaluation for somebody who, uh, uh, who has history of Parkinson's disease because um, the Lewy body dementia will have dementia and then features of Parkinson's. And in Parkinson's disease, there is the features of Parkinson's and later they can develop dementia. So which came first? Um, so in, in, in that scenario, when you want somebody to be managed very um, uh, carefully and uh, regularly for their Parkinson's, you do want to refer to neurology. And uh, vascular dementia at times, you know, when they are high risk for another stroke and you want secondary prevention and you can consult them. Um, and let them know this is what we are doing if they want to add or subtract anything. Normal pressure hydrocephalus, that is uh, you know, by the findings on the CT scan and their 
typical gait disturbance and their urinary incontinence, the triad of uh, NPH. And if there is abnormal imaging, we do work up for dementia and on imaging, we find a mass sitting there, then yes, we do need a referral. Okay, brain imaging is not necessary for every patient. Um, but, you know, when by the time we get the patients, they have so many other things going on. And if they have not had a recent uh, brain imaging, it's not a bad idea. If the clinical um, assessment requires, we go ahead with imaging also to have a baseline. Um, it's usually done in patients with less than 65 to, to rule out any other um, uh, pathology going on. And if there is obviously signs of stroke and um, clinical pictures suggestive of normal pressure hydrocephalus with a broad-based gait and urinary incontinence, then at that point, you do want to make sure to look at the ventricles. And if there is any suspicion of head trauma, uh, because as we saw in that image, you know, the brain atrophies and uh, these people, uh, when they have even trivial injury, they hit the head by, you know, the headboard or they fall, um, it, the, the hematomas that they form, there is a lot of space for them to grow between the skull and the brain, right? Uh, as compared to the regular um, uh, uh, brain anatomy, they have a lot of space. So the, the, the subdural hematomas grow and they may be fine at that time, but three days later, they are like, you know, totally out of it. So we do want to make sure if there is any uh, uh, history of fall, head injury, that has to be has to be imaged because we don't want to miss any brain bleed, uh, intracerebral or subdural hematomas. Then we have uh, PET scan. PET scan it basically catches the activity of the brain, and it's basically to differentiate mainly uh, the frontotemporal uh, temporal dementia, which is the front. The uh, Alzheimer's dementia is global. Uh, Lewy body is global too. Uh, however, in Alzheimer's dementia, the perihippocampus areas are more lit up. So these are more advanced studies. But if we want to remember why we want this, this part is more important. Consider imaging in what scenarios. Do not miss a stroke, please. Do not miss normal pressure hydrocephalus. Do not miss any head trauma causing any bleed. Okay, so we have, um, so the nurse brings us who's trained in MOCA, um, MOCA um, uh, test. She does the test um, and then she brings to the physician. And what happens, okay, I'll tell you how it is in a clinical setting in memory care clinic. What happens is that um, initially it could vary from, um, you know, uh, university to university or center to center. Um, but what uh, we are following is, uh, there is a nurse intake initially, which is on phone. Uh, first of all, there is a referral from the primary care physician, right? That there are some memory issues. The patient is not understanding what I'm telling him. There is a change. Would you please uh, evaluate for uh, any underlying dementia and what kind and what stage? So the nurse, um, basically nurse intake is on phone with the caregiver and she collects information of where the problem is and how severe it is, what is their main concern, what's bothering them the most. And she makes sure that the, the, the set of labs that we talked about that is already done, if imaging is required, that is already done. So the, the time patient comes to us. Okay, when patient comes to us, the initial information we have, and then, um, patient always is supposed to come with a caregiver, the family member who's taking care of the patient, and then both of them are separated, okay? Then the nurse does the MOCA uh, test with uh, the patient, and the physician goes to the caregiver, the family member, and take the history that we talked about. And then um, the nurse brings you the MOCA result, you review it, and then you uh, get to see the patient and the caregiver together. And then you let them know um, what the issue is, what can be done about it, discuss uh, with them um, you know, their concerns and go from there. Um, what is important is 
always please uh, because you know it's it's you don't want to label somebody with big uh, you know um, terms you have alzheimer's dementia you have this you have, no uh, it, it can be you know you have to be very um, cognizant of you know uh, how sure are you if you're not sure and the patient is you know uh, um, it, 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 the functional status is not meeting with the the numbers you can always repeat the testing in six months and you can say neurocognitive disorder. You don't have to label them with dementia. But when there is clear cut uh, mild cognitive impairment or mild moderate severe dementia, you do want to tell them, you know, this is this is what it is. And let's, you know, then open the conversation. Let's talk about it. Let's be, you know, uh, tell me what's bothering you. How do you take um, uh, me telling you that this is the diagnosis? So um, listen to them. And, and um, you know, be there for them to discuss what they think and what can you do for them. Okay. Now, uh, while we are doing all that, we want to make sure that we are ruling out any vision issues that affected the MOCA screen. We are ruling out any hearing problems uh, that affected the MOCA screen, any brain injury, and alcohol use. Okay. Then you have to modify, you know, the approach. Um, uh, how you want to repeat it and uh, where do you want to refer um, and uh, you can follow up the patient uh, case to case basis. Okay, National Institute of Alzheimer's Association, the criteria is that um, cognitive or neuropsych symptoms that interfere with function at work or usual activities that should be i'm bringing this in because um this will you know this uh, captures a lot in in a nutshell that you know what are we looking at in terms of alzheimer's it affects the function at work or usual activities and there is always a decline from the previous level it's not like the same you know five years ago i used to forget um to pay the check even now i'm doing the same and it's not affecting activities of daily living. Somehow he manages. Sometimes uh, so, somehow he um, uh, catches up. So that's that, that. That's not Alzheimer's. There is a decline from previous level, and then um, it, we are catching the cognitive impairment. We are detecting it through combination of history from both patient and informant, and uh, the assessment that we did. You know, the scoring should be there. And scoring should be in the chart. And uh, right now with EMR and all, you can actually put the MOCA score images in there and the score, and then you can compare it with, you know, how it was one, one year prior or, you know, how will it be in six months from now? So uh, always compare with the previous one. And uh, uh, the other thing that I uh, want to bring up is that um, always uh, uh, document that uh, there is uh, there is congruency. There is uh, uh, the the history that is provided by the patient as well as the informant. The answers are congruent. Uh, if not, usually you know patient may say, "Oh, uh, you know what? I don't have any problems." But then a caregiver is telling you all the details, so you will get an idea, you know, that uh, the, what the actual situation is. Okay, now we are talking about that Alzheimer's, it involves two dom domains. One is the memory part, right? At least two domains. One is the memory part that, you know, they, they, um, their inability to remember new information and, you know, how to, uh, the other areas would be to handle complex tasks. Um, uh, this will be basically uh, their insight and then their uh, visual spatial uh, abilities, then their language, how are they reading the same books uh, or they are following what they're watching on TV um, or they are just sitting there and watching and they are not getting what actually the program is about and any changes in personality, behavior. So any of those two domains, but usually the, the remembrance part, the memory has to be there um, and uh, along with um, uh, one or, uh, or all of them or some of them. So until now, what we talked about, I think um, we 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 can agree with that the differential diagnosis um, is uh, normal aging. Normal aging. I'll just recap, uh, you know, quickly. Um, normal aging is in, in which the activities of daily living are not affected. Okay, and and their instrumental activities of daily living may be affected here and there, like you know some 
some mistake with the finances, some mistake with the meal prep, forgot to put off the stove, uh, some mistake here and there with the medication management, or you know, forgot to take the right bus, not forgot the bus number, um, but you know, then was able to cope with it. So that's normal aging, and it's not a pattern, and it's not getting worse, right? Then mild cognitive impairment that will be differentiated with the scoring. Uh, 26 is the is the number. Uh, more than that is normal. Less than 26 is mild cognitive impairment. And then you know around um, 18, 19 we we start talking about um, mild dementia and then um, moderate. Okay, delirium. Uh, I think I'll talk more a little later. But delirium is. Um, uh, change in consciousness, uh, and it's a confusional, acute confusional state, okay? Delirious patient will not look into your eyes, um, but a dementia patient will look into your eyes, and with full conviction, he will say, yes, the president is Kennedy these days, okay? But delirious patient is just, you know, very sick, ill-looking, or confused, or, you know, uh, not with the program, um, uh, and showing confusion, actually. Um, that is uh, the big, uh, you know, delirium uh, is mostly seen um, more in uh, acute hospitalization setting in acute illness. Dementia patient can be at home doing other things and, you know, is carrying dementia with them. Depression, there is some psychomotor retardation. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it. I will not go in detail right now. Then we have the differentiation between Alzheimer's, vascular, Lewy body. I'll just summarize. Um, Alzheimer's is, um, okay, the diagnosis of Alzheimer's, uh, the, the def definitive diagnosis is only by, you know, we cannot diagnose it until the patient dies and we do a brain study, a biopsy and all that. Um, however, the, the, the history and the assessment and the scoring and eliminating other causes of dementia and how the CT scan, you know, the distribution of the atrophy and the distribution of around the hippocampus atrophy and the ventricles, that will, that's, that's a given uh, for Alzheimer's. Um, then um, vascular, there's always history of uh, TIA, there's always history of hypertension, diabetes. In diabetes, as I said, um, dementia is called as um, type 3 diabetes. Lewy body dementia, there is one thing if you want to remember about Lewy body is visual hallucinations. They hallucinate and they see interesting things. Uh, so we'll, uh, we'll get there and we'll touch, touch it quickly. Other frontotemporal dementia, alcohol, Parkinson's disease, neurosyphilis, frontotemporal, there is always a behavioral problem. There's disinhibition, um, hypersexuality, um, or cursing people. So those kinds are frontotemporal. By history, you would know, and uh, because it's frontotemporal, the the um, the brain picture will be also on scan, evident that the, the problem is only the frontotemporal region. Alcohol history and Mind, um, uh, don't forget that you know it can be a mixed thing. It can be Alzheimer's with alcohol. It can be vascular alcohol and Alzheimer's. So, and then Parkinson's we talked about, and neurocephalus will be obviously um, diagnosed. Um, so we will know that this this is uh, what it is. Okay, quickly. Um, no uh, consistent progressive deviation on testing of memory with normal aging. It becomes, they do things, but it, it is harder for them to do those same things and they do it, they take their own time, but they, they, they get around it, you know, they, they are able to complete what they need to. Uh, they do set their own uh, visual tapes, notes and all. If you are doing that, don't worry about it, we all do it. But as a compensatory mechanism in normal aging, people do these reminder works and it helps them, it doesn't affect their, affect their activities of daily living. Um, and then obviously we talked about that uh, with normal aging, it, it doesn't affect their uh, instrumental or regular activities, mild cognitive impairment. Um, we have one cognitive domain <coughs> which can be <coughs> measured um, by the testing. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so far, you know, people with mild cognitive impairment may be still working. They have not retired and they are able to keep up with their jobs. There is not any impairment in their independent living. 
but they do progress with time, uh, uh, um, a certain percentage to Alzheimer's disease. Now, delirium versus dementia, uh, they may, if in a hospitalized setting, this is, the, 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 do not miss this, please. In a hospitalized setting, a patient may be delirious, can acute confusional state, as I said, with impaired consciousness and attention. They will not look into your eyes to answer questions. They have altered speak, uh, speak, uh, sleep uh, cycles and th their cognitive function is fluctuating. Sometimes they are fine and other times of the day, they, um, they are very confused. And this is different than sundowning in dementia. Here, there is no pattern. And they, it's an acute onset, right? The patient was fine when he had, was admitted for, um, say, COPD exacerbation. Um, but he got confused suddenly, ICU psychosis. And, you know, um, this all happened within the hospitalization. And then, you know, later, three weeks down the road, everything back to normal. Okay, one thing that I don't want you to forget is that anybody with delirium uh, who is of age, um, say a 78 year old male with multiple medical problems admitted uh, with CHF exacerbation and got delirious in ICU, uh, uh, seen by psych, medication, uh, uh, pharmacist was called in to review the medications. They made some adjustments. Um, and uh, we, um, after a week or so, when he came home, he, uh, he, was, um, he was at his baseline for his cognition. Now, um, in, in that scenario, and if there is a family history, even if there is not a family history, I would keep an eye on this patient because sometimes the first delirium um, is basically unmasking underlying dementia also. There could be underlying dementia, which is because the dementia people remember, they are more prone to getting delirious than non-dementia people. So even if it is not diagnosed, you know, a patient with the same patient with CHF exacerbation um, was fine. He, he works and he goes to work every day, nine to five, he's working. He himself is struggling with some domains here and there with some memory issue, but he's able to carry on his work. Uh, but when he comes to the hospital, he gets delirious. So he needs a workup down the road. Um, and especially when all the delirium is gone, otherwise the test will not be correct. When he's back to his baseline, he should be evaluated to uh, look out for any underlying uh, memory impairment. Uh, depression versus dementia, as I said, um, there is in a uh, depression patient, you know, you will see that there is uh, the concentration is, is impaired. And they, they have lack of motivation. They have la a loss of interest. They have apathy. When you give them the, the test to do, they, they do not have much motivation to do that test. And uh, however, they, they maintain their language and motor skills and their cognitive complaints um, exceed measure deficits, right? They keep complaining and they, have, and they are not too much interested to show that they do not have uh, memory issues. In contrast to a dementia patient, he will say, like uh, the other day I had a patient, she's 92 and she says, uh, I don't have any memory issues. My family thinks so. Uh, I can remember things from hundred years ago. You asked me. So they wanna prove that they do not have memory issues. Um, but a, dementia, a depression patient, he, he is not motivated to, uh, to do that. Uh, psychomotor retardation is there. Uh, now, Alzheimer's disease is 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 a gradual process. It uh, you know from mild from cognitive impairment to severe. It may take five to ten years, or um, you know maybe even longer. Or if they have on top of uh, that any vascular issues, other comorbid condition, it can, it can be earlier with some mixed picture. Um, okay, imaging is global atrophy and small hippocampal volumes that we talked about. Um, vascular, it can be sudden because, you know, 
a stroke happened and then patient, uh, you know, is um, we do the slump score and it's it's low. And then uh, we repeat it and we do a MOCA and we find out there is a big difference. And, you know, it, it can, the, the stroke can solely affect just the memory or it can affect memory with motor problems. Um, then uh, it is uh, stepwise um, and there is evidence of ischemia and uh, it will show um, cortical or subcortical white matter disease, uh, white matter changes on MRI. When there is extensive white matter changes, um, that is more suggestive of uh, this. Lewy body dementia, as I said earlier, if you wanna remember one thing for your MCQs or for you know, a, a case, visual hallucinations, and they act out their dreams. Um, the Lewy body dementia people have features of Parkinson, so Parkinsonism. They may have cogwheel rigidity, um, but the dementia uh, and the presentation of the symptoms and the hallucinations come first, followed by um, 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 by the Parkinsonism. In Parkinson's, eventually they de they do develop uh, memory impairment, um, and here also it's all global but then the history is different. Um, we do see hallucinations uh, in advanced dementia, but they are later. And in Lewy body, they are the hallmark. Frontotemporal, as I said, and it occurs in younger folks. And it, there is a lot of inhibition and hyperorality, lip smacking and things like that. Um, they, in, in this also, the atrophy is in the frontal and temporal lobes. So that is helpful if we have a patient with dementia issue and his age is just 59 and um, there are some behavioral issues going on, very suggestive that he will have this kind. Okay, now, since we talked about the ADLs and IADLs, why I keep talking about the ADLs? And because it affects our history taking, it, um, it affects our management, and it helps us to determine the progression of dementia. So we have uh, these stages of dementia. In stage one, there is no cognitive impairment, uh, and it's only by numbers when we review. Um, and then in mild, and they are forgetting familiar uh, words or names or location of keys, eyeglasses, everyday objects. Um, and these problems, however, are not evident when they are with their uh, families or they are working, right? Now, the mild cognitive decline may be, um, can, can manifest itself in a subtle way where families, friends, or coworkers would know that there is um, some deficit um, and there is a change. Then in, um, in stage four, there are clear cut deficits in which the ADLs are getting, uh, sorry, IADLs are getting effective. Um, there are some mistakes in the meal prep and you know, the finances and the medication management and all that. Then stage five, now comes the ADL part. Now the ADL is getting affected too. Now the memory is so down. Now we have problems with dressing, eating, toileting, grooming, bathing, because there are other domains also, the judgment, the insight, the visuospatial, the attention, the focus, everything is now getting affected. So now it's presented with the impaired ADLs and they need help um, in, in, in those activities. Uh, then is the uh, next stage in which they need extensive help. And stage seven is when they are basically bed bound and, you know, they, they are not eating enough and um, they are totally dependent for all activities of daily living for other people. Okay, I want to just on this stage, when people are on this uh, at this stage, a um, couple things. We do want to uh, make sure to actually even before this stage, uh, around stage five or so, just you know, um, make sure that um, to see if the patient is a candidate for palliative care, and the goals of care are um, are vivid, are clear um, on patient's part. When the problems start, we want to make sure that they are ad advanced directives because later in these stages, patient will not be able to make his own decisions. So we want to have goals of care determined, and which is called life care planning ahead of time. So this is our general progression of dementia. 
So now we'll talk about goals of treatment and just remember that the patient himself is having a hard time. It's not that he's giving us a hard time. And we want to make some change in this part that how can we make that hard time less hard time? The primary goal of treatment is basically to enhance the quality of life and to maximize the functional performance by improving the cognition, the behavior, and the mood. So we have non-pharmacological uh, management um, for which you know, there is cognitive rehab. In, um, there are resources for that. There is individual and group therapy that patients can be involved and even caregivers have their own individual and group therapy to cope with the situation. Uh, physical and mental activity, very important, and regular appointments to be followed up and see the trend and education of um, the, the caregivers and safety uh, evaluation. Some, uh, I'll, I'll talk about it uh, briefly. Um, safety evaluation is must before we have any ne negative outcome, we have to uh, screen for safety. And obviously uh, simple things, environmental modifications, like you know, have digital clocks, do not give the arms and hands and all that, and have calendars for their appointments, make a list for their to-do list, and set a pill box for them and somebody to supervise that, visual cues. And that's why where caregiver training is also involved. And obviously the biggest and global is simple and compassionate communication style that goes through throughout in this course, that um, that has to uh, be there. Um, so this is our main thing to see where we can make them more mentally active, more physically active, and what are they eating? And they're eating. You have to make sure there is um, not uh, 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 the simple carb overload uh, for them. Uh, at that stage, it's very hard to you know uh, uh, cope with bad diet and then poor activity. So uh, have a plan for that. And then talking about the pharmacological management, as I said, every patient is unique and treatment should be individualized. Uh, we have cholinesterase inhibitors. We'll talk briefly, touch base on briefly on those. Then we have memantin, another group, and some cognitive enhancers that have not shown any uh, clinically significant effects. So, uh, why I wanted to bring that is that we talk about it, but when patients ask you, you should know, you know how to respond to those questions. Um, then we have antidepressants and psychoactive medications. When do they kick in? And at what point um, it, it's, it, it's important to titrate up or wean off? Um, so we'll talk first about the cholinesterase inhibitors. What they are doing is basically they are um, inhibiting the, uh, the breaking down of the acet acetylcholine. And uh, what they have shown, I think it came in 2003 or so, but what they are showing is that there is modest delay in cognitive decline compared with placebo. What we see in clinical practice is that um, there is no significant change Patients sometimes is disappointed, or family, uh, I would say, is disappointed that there's not much change. But what happens is it's actually delaying the progression. So we have to explain to the patient that to some extent it's de delaying the progression. And there is no hard and fast rule, you know. Um, if they are not, um, there are side effects, you have to pull, pull it out. Uh, then the GI side effects are very common, including uh, nausea, diarrhea, um, and um, uh, there are four drugs that are there. Um, rivastigmine and uh, Pericept are used more. Um, and the two other side effects that I want to bring up is that um, Ericept and Donazepil uh, has uh, two side effects. Uh, one is bradycardia we have to watch out for. If the patient already has problems with that, I would avoid it. Uh, nightmares is another. So for that reason, sometimes for nightmares, you want to give it in the daytime to avoid that. Um, but if they have bradyca the, the risk for bradycardia and dizziness and fall, then you know you have to look at the situation and then the, the, the night dose is better. So it's usually good in early part of dementia. And um, it is used in vascular uh, uh, dementia, but it, it, 
it's not a recommendation. Uh, usually, sometimes the anxiety piece is taken care of it um, somehow, but we can do other things for that. Um, Lewy body dementia, they have seen some benefit. And uh, in Parkinson's, the reverse stigmine is FDA approved. Uh, do not use in frontotemporal, it will uh, worsen their agitation. So just to remember, you wanna use it in early part and it's not helpful in vascular because those are the two um, we'll come across the most. Okay, this is very important. Please, please, as I mentioned, you have to know what medications they are taking. Uh, usually there is a polypharmacy going on. They are taking unnecessary stuff with a lot of side effects. And to treat those side effects, some physician gives them another medication and it's a vicious circle. So de-escalation and de-prescribing of medications is, is extremely important. If you cannot do anything out of that visit, you know, and it's, you know, the, the patient is not compliant and we don't have enough history, whatever, do one thing, look at the medications and get rid of the unnecessary ones and keep the, the most simplest regimen for them. Um, most common meds, you know, with the anticholinergic effect, patient is mild cognitively impaired and goes, uh, gets a cold, uh, goes to pharmacy and gets himself some Benadryl and taking it to you know, relieve his symptoms, sleeping well and all that. And guess what? He has next urinary retention, he has severe constipation and he's confused. So those kinds of things we want to please um, make sure that, um, uh, that we are eliminating all those reversible causes of confusion and um, eliminating any possibility of side effects from the medications because this is very fragile uh, population, you know, uh, they manifest side effects much more than mm, the rest. Okay, so this I think is a very important slide. I, I, I am very big on, you know, cutting down on medications. Um, so I like this, what um, yeah, there was a quality, uh, long-term care quality letter by, by Brown University and I, uh, any symptom in an elderly patient should be considered a drug side effect until proven otherwise. So that will explain what I just mentioned. Polypharmacy is considered when uh, the patient is on five or more medications. What's happening? What, what are the medications bringing with them? Frailty, mortality, disability, fall risk, and falls, and then hospitalization, and then you know um, um, delirium, and then, you know, um, deconditioning, debility, and then again, vicious circle. There is a four time risk of fall if patient is on more than five medications and six times risk of fall if the patient is on uh, more than 10 medications. Mimantin is um, another um, um, uh, medication in the list of uh, uh, drugs to treat, to manage uh, dementia. What it does is um, it's basically to reduce the glutamate mediated ex excitotoxicity. What it does is it's basically um, in simple uh, words, it's, it's decreasing the influx of calcium in the cells, uh, which can basically, uh, which is actually involved in the dysfunctioning of the uh, neuron. So there is modest benefit on cognition. Uh, it is actually, uh, to be used in moderate to severe, not in early dementia. And the common side effects are constipation, dizziness, headache, though they seem like, you know, with every medication, but in our population, geriatric population, look out for all these and, you know, manage accordingly and ask them. And, uh, you know, um, you, you may have to ask active questions because they may not be able to offer that information by themselves. So uh, and one thing I, uh, uh, we want to remember is that in Memantin, Namenda, we want to make sure that there is a, a, a renal dose adjustment. You know, um, if their renal function is less, we don't want them to, to have toxicity from the medication because um, they, the, the, the medication is uh, remaining in the body for much longer time because the kidney cannot process it. So renal dose adjustment for this medication or any other medication that should be our priority as well for, for everybody, especially in geriatrics. 
Now these, uh, as I said, uh, vitamin E, serotonin, ginkgo biloba, every, uh, all of them, the bottom line is that um, they have not shown uh, evidence of uh, cognitive impairment, you know, a significant evidence here and there. They have done studies based on which people take. It's easily available over the counter, or, uh, but, you know, they come with their own baggage and uh, there is no significant improvement uh, in either in slowing down the cognitive decline or in cognitive improvement. Uh, improvement. Okay. So interestingly, I think it was June 6th, a few days ago, the, um, the big news, uh, you may uh, know about it, came out and you know everybody got very excited about it, that there is a new medication after years, um, aducanumab uh, for Alzheimer's disease. Uh, it came out in the market, FDA approved it. Um, so uh, we want to be aware of that. And the thing is that it's like the horse is out of the barn. It did come out too early, I would say, and it's very controversial right now. No physician, geriatrician, or anybody managing patients with Alzheimer's not comfortable, as much as I know, uh, uh, the people I've talked to and what we have studied about this medicine so far, we are not comfortable to start this medicine. It's not even available yet, but it's coming uh, with a lot of monitoring side effects, cost thousands of dollars in, in, for a year, and uh, it can cause brain edema. We need scans regularly. And um, the, the two trials that were done, were they had to be actually stopped for the fertility reason. And the one trial out of which, it looks like they just took out the, the positive part of it. So there's a lot of controversy. Um, if somebody asks about this medicine uh, right now, uh, we are not in any intention to start on our patients until we have uh, more data. And it looks like a long way, but um, it's. I think the release of this medicine by FDA is premature, um, but we will, we will see, time will tell. Now, um, symptom management, um, behavioral disturbances should be managed non-pharmacologically, not like you just give some anti-anxiety medication or antipsychotic medication. We have to stay away from all that as much, as much, as much as we can. We have to reduce overstimulation. Uh, we have to modify their environment. We have to provide them safe environment. We have to provide them with the routine. The case, uh, the caregiver has to work in conjunction with us and um, uh, provide them uh, uh, an atmosphere where there's no confrontation and there is a set routine and uh, be in touch. Um, if they are obviously um, significantly depressed, um, then you know depressed mood, low appetite, insomnia, fatigue, irritability and agitation can also be a manifestation of uh, 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 depression. There you wanna use antidepressants uh, but certain medications with falls and anticholinergic side effects causing further confusions and making their dementia worse, we don't want to do that. I always uh, consult with my um, uh, psychiatry colleagues for this so that they can also, there is another set of eyes watching and uh, we can together come up with a plan. Okay, if there is a lot of um, paranoia, and hallucinations have started and, you know, a um, lot of irritability to the extent that uh, there is a safety concern for the patient himself or the people around him. And then you have to, um, uh, to, to see if there is any role of antipsychotic. We want to avoid that. There are ways to take care of the things that I just mentioned. And they, but if we are using antipsychotics, they have to be used with extreme caution in just targeting the particular delusion that they have or the particular paranoia that they have or the hallucination that they have. And it should be very short term and there should be a plan for when to taper it down and taper it off. Again, um, uh, it's, 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 um, it's 
I, and the recommendation is that the psychiatry uh, team will, uh, should also be part of this management. Um, so they can provide us with their input and provide substitutes if there are side effects and all that. Um, valproic acid and carbamazepine have uh, effects on, um, on the mood and the hallucination and all also, um, but there is limited evidence. Uh, again, the benzodiazepines um, and the anticholinergic, um, those avoid and basically keep them out of the patient's list. Again, it's, it's a teamwork. If we need to do referrals, we do to the neuropsych, uh, neurologist, psych, and then memory care clinic. Uh, we want to involve physical therapy. Physical therapy comes in handy when we want the occupational therapist to go home and evaluate for uh, safety. Um, then, then this important part, attorney for will uh, conservatorship and the estate planning is very important. Um, that comes with the advanced directives, the, um, the financial uh, part of it. And then again, um, there is something called um, respite care. Medicare gives us 14 days in a year for respite care that if there is a caregiver who is so exhausted or, you know, caregiver has her daughter who's graduating in Florida. She wants to go there, but her dad is at home with dementia. So Medicare says, bring your loved one to us in a, a long-term care facility. Patient will be admitted for that much time as a respite patient and patient will be like a guest there and all the medications, everything is managed. Um, usually sometimes caregivers split it into one week and one week and they take breaks um, because they need breaks. And um, that is something that, you know, through insurance, it's, it's covered. Um, they can also be uh, uh, involved in an adult daycare, which are specialized for um, dementia uh, population. They provide a routine and, you know, some stretching exercises, some watching movie, playing bingo, all those kinds of things. But if it works for, if they are at a stage where it works for them, then, you know, go for it. Alzheimer's Association is doing an excellent job. They provide great resources. They talk to the people. They are in touch with the families. They talk to the caregivers and, you know, keep modifying their resources for that particular case. We can also hook them up with Meals on Wheels and, you know, senior citizen centers. And usually, you know, the social worker and case manager, it's not all on physician, just to make it clear. The social worker and case manager helps us with all this. We, we are supposed to supervise all this and make sure that, you know, patients are involved and, and are utilizing these resources. This is important slide. Uh, there is something called rapid referral for Alzheimer's Association um, that we can refer them. And then uh, we give the information of the after uh, getting the consent from the caregiver, or if the patient is able to give consent, then they are referred to Alzheimer's Association. And then they take over from there. As I said, they do a great job. Now, uh, life care planning is basically advanced directive about the goals of care. Things like, um, you know, um, the overall uh, goals of care. And that includes, uh, this is most is for Maryland order of life sustaining treatment. This one is physician's order of life sustaining treatment. It's, it's, a, it's a form for every state with different names, um, but it has eight categories. It basically is talking about um, if your heart stops, you want to be DNR, do you want intubation done or not? Do you want, if it comes to the point, do you want blood transfusion done or not? Um, if you, uh, if there comes a point, you want comfort care where you are, or you want to be hospitalized, um, do you want invasive workup or just regular workup or no medical workup? So those kinds of things, it depends on what stage they are at, and you can give them some advice and then the caregiver and the patient, if he's able to, then they take the decisions uh, to fill out this form. And it is a form that works in it should be part of the ambulance if the patient is being transferred to 911 and um, hospital, nursing home. Um, then, you know, everybody knows if the patient codes, you look at this form. Now, this website, uh, take a note of this. Uh, U UCLA has an excellent, uh, has done an excellent work on um, dementia. And um, this is the UCLA Health. If you go to, then go to dementia and care, caregiver education. This is excellent. 
um, sometimes when I sit with the patients and caregivers in the examination room, uh, I show them this, you know, like a three minute uh, video. If they have a problem that, you know, the daughter is complaining that mom doesn't listen to me when she dresses up and she dresses up, you know, it doesn't make sense when she chooses her own clothes. So there is a, a video on that, just a three minute. And uh, caregivers are thrilled to, to see that. And they, you know, give me feedback that, yes, I learned this from it. Small little things that can make difference in their day-to-day -day life. Then you can um, recommend them some books for the caregivers. The big one is 36 hour day. And as I mentioned, OT evaluation for home safety and safe return bracelets are very important for patients who are um, uh, who have uh, who have started to wander in, in the neighborhood, uh, you know, and um, they are not aware of the severity of the problem. Um, they only find out, unfortunately, when there is a negative outcome. So and they are not even aware of that there is a facility of having a safe return bracelet a lot of time. So. Uh, it's it's important to bring that up and um, you know uh, connect them with the the uh, right uh, resource for that. Driving is big, huge thing because you see how this person who was the head of the family now um, losing control over things and somebody else is managing things for him. He is still driving, so there comes a time when driving is the sole um, uh, uh, thing that they hold on to their control, they feel like they are in control by driving, you know? So just to take away their license and tell them that, no, you cannot drive anymore because it's a safety issue, that becomes very difficult. And it like, requires a lot of talking and, you know, um, uh, uh, education, re-education, um, so there are patients who have mild cognitive impairment and mild dementia. They manage it. Um, they are able to drive and drive safe. They can get a driving eval evaluation through a DMV uh, or through occupational therapist. Uh, you, you will get pushback from the patient and family at times. Maybe not families. Sometimes families want them to stop driving. Um, so you can have a startup plan ahead of time and uh, driving plan if stop driving to work with the social worker around uh, about that and if there is a concern then uh, you and if it's, it's a major concern that the patient is totally you know is not in agreement and he is a danger on the road then you do want to um, uh, involve DMV and it, it, the the and the procedure for that actually varies from state to state um, in some states, you are bound to involve the, um, to the Department of Motor Vehicle. Uh, in other states, you recommend or encourage. Um, so it depends. But as a physician, your job is to look at the safety of himself and the people around him and make recommendations and work on it and follow up on it. Okay, now we are switching gears a little bit. I want to touch base uh, on this concept also, that there are, you, it, you won't be surprised that there are certain elderly people living with a caregiver who is not the best caregiver. And he, he, the patient is 911. We always, we often see that, that a patient is uh, sent 911 to the hospital for some injury or some pneumonia or any medical condition. And they, they are, they're, they're in ER, they, we, we find out that they have some bruises. And on CT scan, there is some, some hairline fracture. And uh, the patient is, fearful, and you catch the signs and basically that there is elder abuse going on. And you try to talk to the family, the, the, the caregiver who is either very offensive or very defensive, or there is, you know, they are not giving the correct information and they are avoiding certain part of communication and all. So you get the idea. And basically, uh, you, uh, you should report it to Adult Protective Services. Do not hesitate whenever Whenever you have this um, suspicion, do not hesitate to report it to Adult Protective Services. Okay, now, so when the patient is becoming demented, you know, as I mentioned earlier, 
but you know maybe he has still has those higher fun functions to decide that you know if things happen i talked about the post form um, life sustaining treatment form if this happens please do not put me to machines or i don't want in any condition to have dialysis make sure you use that time since he's able to make those decisions and get it documented get to, uh, get him help for life prayer planning people to do the advanced directives with him um so that that all is determined because you never know after 2 years he's not able to do that and then uh, nobody knew that this is what he wanted and uh, guess what he is intubated in icu and um, you know against his wishes that were not discussed with him so we do not want that so do it at the time when we are able to make decisions when they are not able to make decisions then that's another story that the next of kin or the power of attorney comes in that can be a separate talk uh decision making capacity how do you determine that this patient has determined uh, decision making capacity he may be forgetful he may have mild cognitive impairment he may have um some forgetfulness from the aging but he is able to appreciate the situation he understands the information related to the issue issue he thinks rationally he if if uh, you know he is told that what would you do if you find a stamped addressed envelope on the road he has um, a, a, a rationale to answer his questions he expresses his choices and he tells you why he cho cho chose that now um he may make a bad decision uh, but he has he can stand for his decision i'm doing this because of this 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 it may be bad for you but he has his own decision making capacity to make that decision so let him make those decisions and take care of the advance directives and the life care planning um before it gets too late now this is an interesting study i wanted to bring in and this was done in utah and um just to bring in the importance of caregiver closeness this study i think started in 1990s and finished like in 2000 uh sometime in early 2000s so it was a, a longitudinal long standing study and it it was it was basically what they were studying was that what's the impact of caregiver help in patients with dementia what's the trajectory and they found out that caregiver closeness was associated associated with a slower cognitive decline and regular use of coping strategy strategies that is focused on a problem solving approach uh, it slowed the rate of functional decline and cognitive de decline this is huge because you know see the the point is it's not requiring those millions of dollars here it's requiring care genuine care inside the house from a caregiver so this much difference it can make that even the medications cannot make that's that's the reason of bringing this uh, up here uh caregiver burnout is another thing we want to know this term caregiver been burned out some caregivers you know we talked that the other part of the spectrum the elder abuse now we have this um this caregiver who wants to do any and everything for his loved one but is burnt out by by helping day in and day out starting from morning you know maybe the day starts with a urine incontinence or you know change, changing of clothes giving a bath preparing the meals for him and you know feeding him like we feed babies um it depends i'm just giving you an extreme example so <clears throat> so we have to monitor for that and when we are interviewing the patient we should also spend couple times to rule out to 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 screen for any caregiver burnout um that's the reason i brought this up that we, we should keep that in mind and if there is caregiver burnout there should be some advice solid advice for them to reach out to their primary care and um, give them you know things like little things like i showed you the us ucla um videos not just for you know how to manage but they have certain videos for caregiver burnout also how to manage things in a video form which is sometimes you know more uh, user friendly than you know giving them at discharge a a a, a pile of papers to with, with all these uh, 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 advice and um, uh that is uh, may not be as user friendly than a 3 minute 4 minute 5 minute video um couple books you can find uh, you know all the time and this um uh, if, even if you google uh, you know best books for caregivers for alzheimer's disease or for the patients themselves 
Um, there is an excellent article, um, The Science of Alzheimer's, what it is, how it touches hope. It's a time uh, uh, edition article. And then um, the, this book, Coping with Behavioral Change in Dementia, a Family Caregiver's Guide, excellent book. 36 hour day, this is, you know, any patient, any person who has a dementia patient in the family should read this book. Now this, you know, just whatever we discussed in bits and pieces, I want to compile it in this slide that, um, you know, we are taking care, everything is affecting the other thing. So matters are what we discussed, the advanced directives, the goals of care, um, their um, state planning um, uh, and their uh, medical planning, financial planning, everything. Then we have these medications, their side effects, their uh, effects, then the mobility, and then uh, the memory issue. So we have to work on all these domains. They will help with everything, uh, with um, you know, with each other. And um, th this is. Um, something uh, which we call the big picture in Alzheimer's patients, do not miss the big picture and work on all domains. Uh, keep an eye and rule out any red flags. Okay, so we come to the recap. Um, as we know, I'll just highlight that it's not part of aging uh, for, to have actual dementia. And out of all the dementias, the most common is Alzheimer's and, and then is followed by vascular and it could be mixed also a lot of times where we see both vascular and Alzheimer's. And then is Lewy body dementia. Okay, I, I, I didn't mention about the visual hallucinations. Um, they actually see, um, you know, babies playing under their bed or they act out their dreams. So it's a very typical uh, diagnosis, though it says um, I've seen very few cases, but the cases I've seen, they are very typical. Now, um, the evaluation, we are looking at the history from the caregiver. We are looking at the history from the patient himself, what he has to say. We are doing the functional assessment, the physical assessment. We are making sure that we don't miss out on ruling out important things and focusing on the labs. And if needed, we are doing the brain imaging. And then once we know that there is, we give this diagnosis, we determine the goals and uh, basically to enhance the quality of life and to maximize the function by doing what? By improving the cognition, by improving the mood and the behavior. Uh, treatment includes both non-pharmacological should come first uh, and medications uh, too. And um, be aware of in whatever setting you are, be in touch with your social worker, your case managers uh, at your state level, at your county level, what are the resources and you know, put them all together and see which patient can utilize which one. Okay, so this is what I tell all my students all the time that, um, you know, um, so I, I took the opportunity to bring this slide here also that always treat the patient as a whole, not just you know with the tubular vision of one problem. Um, it will always help us whether we are in geriatrics or in primary care, um, especially in primary care, we have to look at the patient as a whole and um, do not miss the bigger picture. And uh, the pet peeve, the medications, uh, it's always that less medications is more. We are giving them more benefit by cutting down on their medications and making sure that we are not the ones giving them any harm by providing them with a medication that is a little problematic. All right. So these are some of the references. Um, uh, uh, the main um, uh, chunk of my talk was from Geriatrics Care Online, and um, you can also refer to it and up to date, uh, basically. And that's where we finish. But I would like to hear if you have any questions. And thank you so much for being with me and bear with me uh, with all um, on a Saturday morning with all this talk. Thank you, Dr. Singh. 
I really agree that um, it's really important to define patients, to not define patients by their diseases, but rather treating them holistically. So if anyone has any questions, they can feel free to ask now and we will now begin our Q&A session. Thank you very much for that incredibly informative session, Dr. Hussein. My name is Hamza and I'm from New Jersey and I'm matriculating into a joint BSDO program with Seton Hill University and the Lake Erie College of Osteopathic Medicine in Pennsylvania. <clears throat> so to start off our Q&A, are there genetic tests that can help, to help people know if they are at risk for dementia? Yeah, so um, I touched base uh, quickly on that. You know, the, the EPOE4 gene uh, they are talking about. So there are people who want to find out. Uh, if they ask me, like, um, you know, the caregivers, I do not encourage, but I tell them that, yes, this is the test and you would know the probability. However, um, out of 100 patients, uh, it's only those 25 that may have, may manifest uh, themselves later with if the test is positive. So do you want to know about it when you are in 50 and do things, you know, differently? Yeah, it, I think it depends on um, person to person. Uh, whether I would want to do it, no, I don't want to do it. But I want to do all those things that we talked about in, in the talk to, um, to, uh, to, you know, those protective factors, uh, physically well, intellectually well, uh, mentally well, so that to be in an environment where you are being mentally challenged, you are, you are involved in brain activities, you are eating healthy, you are involved in physical activities, that is what you would do to, even if you find out, you will do those things uh, to, to delay the onset or progression and all that. So you can do it without knowing also. But, you know, I just leave it up to the patient and their caregivers, whether they want to, to, to go for it. Right, thank you for that answer. The next question we have is, does mild cognitive impairment lead to dementia? Yeah, um, about, I would say, I think it was on my slide somewhere, um, eight to 9.4 out of 1,000 patients here that they saw uh, lead to dementia down the road. There are some that you can hold the process, you know, to say next 15 years, but the patient dies in 10 years. So that means they never develop dementia. Um, but um, nine out of thousand, if uh, the way they did the study, uh, they led with uh, they automatically went into from MCI to dementia, and we see a lot of it. You know, MCI, um, we see um, two hour, uh, two years later, MOCAS, uh, you know, it, from twenty six, it goes to twenty four. It fluctuates. It goes to twenty three. Then it comes back to twenty six. But then, you know, ultimately you see in five years that, um, yeah, now they, are, they have moderate dementia. Mm -hmm. um, just to clarify, you said eight to 9,000. Is that 8,000 out of 9,000? Or what is the exact sample size that was used? No, it's eight out of 1,000 patient years. It's, it's not uh, like eight out of 1,000 patients. So maybe you can go back on my slide uh, for that. Um, that that actually very um, prominently, you know, obviously do develop MCI, uh, uh, dementia from MCI. All right, thank you for the answer. Here's another question. Mixed dementia includes Alzheimer's disease and vascular dementia. Is there any clinical tool that we can use to differentiate between mixed dementia and Alzheimer's disease? Or is yeah. it just too difficult to differentiate between the two clinically? That's a great question. Uh, no, it's not too difficult. It's, it's a combination of your assessment, patient's history, prior history, the um, imaging. So mixed dementia, you know, even patients who have Alzheimer's, uh, they can have a component of like 4% of Lewy body. They have visual hallucination here and there on PET scan. It shows that they're 85% is Alzheimer's, their 5% is Lewy body, their uh, next 10% is vascular. So <clears throat> uh, if we talk about simple mixed uh, with Alzheimer's and vascular, <clears throat> the imaging will help as we talked about how it differentiates. The history of stroke is big that they have vascular uh, dementia. 
uh, and their uh, their course will also determine. So if there is a patient, for example, who has had stroke in the past and had been fine in the last uh, year or so, now is developing uh, forgetfulness and scores low on MOCA. And if you look at the, uh, the imaging, the imaging is more suggestive of Alzheimer's versus vascular, but there are areas of um, white matter disease. So then it's very suggestive that we are talking about mixed. And it's okay to give the diagnosis of mixed um, to patients with any risk factors with vascular and there is any, um, uh, any evidence of white matter disease on the CT scan, but the rest of the picture is all Alzheimer's. So it's very common and it's okay to say, no, it, this is not entirely Alzheimer's, this is not entirely vascular, this is mixed. Thank you for that answer. Um, here's another question we have. What is the correlation between dementia and depression? Yeah. Um, there, first of all, there is only depression. I'll give you two, three um, scenarios. First, there is only depression that presents like um, dementia, psychomotor retardation. You know, the patient chooses not to remember. So that is our, um, but we have to uh, rule out that. Then there are dementia patients who may present only depressed and their forgetfulness is masked. Then there is a category that you are talking about is that a lot of, I, I don't have exact numbers, but a lot of dementia pa patients because of their um, loss of control, because of their genuine reasons of um, uh, decline in their IADLs, their ADLs, and their living situations, and their overall decline in the cognitive, they do get into depression. So a lot of our patients are, uh, um, and it, it is manifested as, as I said, you know, just uh, refusing to eat or irritability. And then, you know, there is a, uh, there is a screening test of, you know, uh, feeling hopelessness. That may not apply very well to the advanced dementia patients, but then the family can give us enough history to say that, you know, yes, the primary problem is dementia, but now we are seeing these new signs symptoms that, can, that are very suggestive of a depression. So yes, in that scenario, the diagnosis would be depression with ongoing dementia, uh, uh, sorry, de de dementia with ongoing depression. And you want to treat that depression and, um, you know, make sure that the, the, the frailty, the debility, um, uh, we are not attributing to it by patient not willing to eat or not sleeping well because of the depression. So we do want to address that depression in a dementia patient. Thank you very much. Uh, as for our last question, how would you personally define quality of life when determining whether it's worth saving a patient and what are your thoughts on euthanasia and comfort life measures in the United States? So, so quality of life, um, you know, it, it can be different for a patient with, um, I can talk about the dementia patients first and then overall quality of life can be different for a mild dementia patient versus severe dementia patient. Mild dementia patient, you know, quality of life, like, you know, a general, uh, in general population, we want to make sure they maintain their, um, their day-to-day -day activities. They are involved in, uh, in, in a routine and they, and they are able to um, go out with family. They are able to do grocery for themselves. They are able to hang out with friends. Um, they are involved in some, um, you know, um, some of their hobbies or some their leisure time activities from the past. There is a system for that and they have good health care and they are, uh, you know, compliant with their medications. All those things will be a general, you know, the quality of life. In a severe dementia patient who is already bed bound, so you wonder what is the quality of life here? The quality of life in that scenario is to make sure that a bed bound patient who is dependent for all activities is free of skin problems. Um, and they are, um, they, their skin is taken, you know, is well taken care of, uh, skin care. They are, they, uh, they, they have good nutrition for their level. Um, if they cannot eat three big meals to provide them, you know, every two hours nutrition, um, they have somebody, they have some activity at their level 
they cannot be in the bed all the time they have to be out of the bed in a chair and bring brought out if they are in a nursing home to be brought out to activity area and you know to do things for them at their level so the the activity uh, team is is trained to 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 provide them some quality in their day by certain activities for their level that can be some only things like 5 minutes of stretching in the bed and um, reading them some you know uh, some newspaper and then asking them questions and all these are little examples that i'm giving you so uh, we can and then having the caregiver to to have a schedule to come and meet with them uh, if they are in a nursing home setting or assisted living facility um and to involve the friends and family and you know um, there to 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 uh, to have that social interaction and um, obviously to keep them free from infections aspiration precautions and all those things to 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 stabilize the, where they are and uh, to avoid any complications uh, like you know pressure sores or infections or hospitalizations or dehydration or um you know uh, failure to thrive those kinds of things so we can you know uh, see where patient needs help now regarding um what was your other question the uh, the life care planning yes uh what are your thoughts on euthanasia and comfort life measures in the united states okay so uh, comfort uh, life measures euthanasia um it's a very controversial topic in maryland state it's not something that is uh, you know allowed even uh in some states uh, there is um, you know there is some um uh, they are allowed for it and but the majority of the united states um uh, it's it's not something that we do uh, however uh we have to differentiate what i want to focus on on your question uh, to answer that is to differentiate between uh, euthanasia and uh, the comfort measures which uh, we see that we apply those comfort uh, uh, measures and the patient passes away so that's where the families are you know they need some clarity they need discussions they need to sit with them hold their hand and tell them that this is the situation in which i'll give you an example let's make a case um so uh, there is a patient who is 89 year old uh who has history of uh, chf copd osteoarthritis coronary artery disease status post uh, stent uh who is now uh, severely demented um and he is totally dependent for everything and then in the past year he has had say four hospitalizations so where is the quality of life here right so and then this patient becomes um uh, he has chf exacerbation and he said that if it comes to this extent i don't want to go to the hospital and i want to be treated in house with all the comfort measures provided so there is when we do the hospice consult palliative care consult and that's where comfort care is very very beneficial Uh, um that's where we work on mainly symptoms uh, to provide them enough oxygen to help them with medications that will help them with their anxiety to help them uh, with any um uh, you know that's where the held all the um, the anxiolytics those are used without feeling guilty about it that's where they they should come in place not before uh and a morphine sublingual so what morphine is doing is it's taking control control of the pain as well as help, helping with the air hunger the respiratory uh, distress so uh, if we know that there these we can determine you know there is end stage and there is terminal stage end stage are patients who are bed bound with their comorbid condition terminal is when death is ev evident so in those scenarios uh, in a terminal patient with acute symptoms it's it's highly recommended to bring in people who can help you guide you to uh, to um, to implement palliative care comfort care and you know uh, th these patients die comfortably rather dying in an ambulance going 911 they have not re even reached hospital and they pass away they are coded and they pass away so um, it requires um, you know talking with the families and honestly i tell you these are hard discussions but when we do these with the families it's it's back and forth it's 
you know, say for example, we had a one hour meeting with, um, the, uh, with the husband and the daughter. And you know, they, there is episodes of, you know, frustrations, anger, you know, um, they, they, they express it to the physician. But in the end, once everything is decided, this, they sign that, yes, we want to go through palliative care and they see what palliative care does for them. They are so thankful. They appreciate that, you know, uh, in, it's a relief for them. As if like, you know, the burden is away now and they see that this is what uh, my loved one wanted. You know, I, sometimes they do for themselves. Uh, like, uh, you know, yes, I want my loved one to be hospitalized. Actually, they are just trying to treat themselves, not the patient. So what is best for the patient that comfort care brings in and it's, it's, you know, it's very therapeutic for the patient as well as the families. I have not seen yet a family who says why my patient, my, uh, my loved one, you put on comfort care. And yes, there is always a debate, but after that, you know, there is always, you know, the, the consensus that that's good for them. Thank you very much for that answer. And thank you, Dr. Hussain, for all the answers because those are all of our questions. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Hussain. We truly appreciate you taking the time to answer our questions. And I love everyone to please give a warm thank you to Dr. Hussain in the chat box for this incredibly informative session. It's my pleasure. It's, 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 it's an honor for me to be here with all of you. Now we are going to conduct our closing session with our quiz and future session dates. One quick uh, thing, uh, please, I want to mention that if you um, if you had any questions that were not answered or something comes to your mind, please, uh, you, uh, you can put my email in there and you can reach out to me. I'll be happy to go over with you any um, queries that you have in your mind that were not discussed in this topic or in, in the questions that, that were uh, asked. I'll be happy to do that um, some other time. You can always email me. Of course, thank you. I'll, I'll drop your email in the chat box now. There we go. Thank you very much. Sure, my pleasure. Now we're going to conduct our closing session with our quiz and our future session dates. So the link to the quiz for the session is now live. Again, you'll need a 70% or higher to pass and receive certification for this session. On top of that, many of our students have also expressed interest in the leadership position in teleshadowing. We do have positions open on our leadership page as we strongly believe in extending opportunities to others. And that link is also in the chat box now. Now on to our future session dates. These dates will also be posted throughout our social media outlet, so please be sure to follow us at teleshadowing. And we actually have a special session this upcoming Monday with a medical school admissions associate dean and it will be on Monday, not our usual Saturdays, at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time with our physician mentoring us in gastroenterology and medical school admissions. Students will have the great opportunity to ask questions to the Dean of Admissions Live. And thank you so much, everyone, for attending today's session. We hope to see you in our upcoming sessions. And this concludes this week's shadowing session. Thank you.